This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Today's episode of the Motor City Sports Rant is brought to you by Score, a new mobile app coming soon. Score is an interactive game that lets users win deals at bars and restaurants based on what's going on in live sporting events. Find new places to watch the game and save money on your bill at the same time by taking advantage of Score's unique interactive specials that give you an additional stake in the action. A score special can be anything a location wants it to be, from 10% off an item if a team scores a touchdown to a free round of drinks if the quarterback throws for 400 yards. Any stat can be turned into a game. Pick the deals you want to win, watch the games you want to watch, and score deals in real time. The app will update when your teams or players record a relevant stat. When the conditions of your deals are met, coupons are sent to your device to show to your server or bartender. It's that easy. Score is coming to the App Store and Google Play soon. For more information, check them out on the web at score-app.io and follow them on Twitter and Instagram at Score Deals. Score. Watch games. Score Deals. Detroit is the greatest! Straight up light you on fire for a Coney dog right now. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Motor City Sports Rant on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. As always, I am Jason Jarvie. Follow me on Twitter at Jarvie the King. Uh, I almost forgot the name of the podcast there for a second there, John. With me, as always, my buddy, my friend, co-host, John, the Doc Macaroon. What up? See, when you don't come to the office every week, you get out of the rhythm, see? It's easy to sit at your car and make a phone call, but it's hard to just come in here and uh, do the intro. It's okay, though, Jason. It makes it kind of fun. What up, sir? Well, you know, it's uh, just getting the week started with uh, after kind of a, a long weekend. I didn't have a ton to do. Uh, I wasn't feeling too great on on Sunday night, but uh, and also just waking up today uh, on Monday with... Really a heavy heart with a the large it's just a huge tragedy. I I'm, I'm healthy and that's that's all that I can be happy for. I'm I'm I mean I'm healthy. My wife's healthy. My kid's healthy, and that's all I can be happy about right now. Yeah, exactly. And that's what you know we resort to. For me personally, in my family, is when there's tragedies that happen or when things go down in the country. We just pray and we hope that uh, we can learn as a country from this. And for me, I automatically go to, you know, I don't think about too much what would drive an individual to do something like this. It kind of hits me a little bit that there's some potential mental illness. There's issues regarding guns and stuff like that, that people are going to talk about and debate back and forth. But all you can do day to day is be, be part of the solution, which is live a quality life, get your butt to work and try to do the best that you can for yourself and your family and do the things that you care about. And, and on a day like this, it's, it is a little bit tough to talk sports, you know, when people are suffering and when, you know, we got to break down and look at what would drive an individual to set up two platforms, you know, have eight guns and take care of it like and that. To, you know what I mean? So really, if you guys, if you haven't heard, I mean, it's, it's been, you will be hearing this on Tuesday at the earliest and it will have been over 24 hours, but the largest mass shooting in, in U.S. history uh, went down Monday morning in, in Las Vegas. Uh, a shooter set up on top of a set up in a room in the 32nd floor on the Mandalay Bay Hotel and just just open fired. And I think there was around 30,000 people at a at a music concert uh, at the, at the time of this recording. Uh, it's upwards of of 50. Uh, have been confirmed dead. It's over 500 injured, and those numbers will probably climb in the time. And uh, you know, I think we this this podcast station we are in a u- unique position because we do we we have other other things outside of our lives. And you, being a psychologist, you you can you know what you, you have a little bit more insight. So I mean, what you almost can't you just don't know what what 
would drive a person to do something like this. And I think I saw on Twitter that his family member, a brother, came out and said that he, this is not like him, that he potentially just snapped. Yeah, he, he, he called it just an asteroid out of, out of nowhere that the, he had no idea where it came from. A lot of factors go into it, whether it be, you know, your place in society, whether an individual thinks that, you know, uh, anger builds up because, you know, a lot of negative things have happened to him, you know, potentially speaking. But I'm not going to speculate. You know, what we do in the mental health field is we say that you have to have, you know, a lot of information to kind of make a judgment on somebody. But obviously, for somebody to be able to carry it out, I always have to believe that there's some degree of mental illness that at some point in time, somebody stops caring. And then when they make the decision to inflict pain on a lot of people, I think word was that the police didn't even get to him at the hotel that he committed suicide. So somebody like that was hell bent on causing havoc on his way out. And it's unfortunate, like you said, the largest mass shooting in the country. And it's a sad time because, you know, it it always makes you think because there's a lot of events now going on around town. Little Caesars is about to kick off with both the Red Wings and the Pistons regular season. This Sunday is hell in a cell. I'm potentially going to go with my wife to that. Does it give you a little bit more pause when you think about buying tickets for an event or going to things? Because it does. It just always, you know, when we're out and about, we just kind of look around a little bit more be more aware of our surroundings, but there's a little bit more fear that's inherent when we hear stuff like this. I think it does a little bit. I think the the mindset you have to you have to have going forward is that you can't let this completely change the way that you live your life. So if you're if you're just going to stop going places, you're going to stop going to to Vegas or going to to events, and then then whoever the evil that is take, that's doing this, they they ultimately win because. They will have pretty much ruined everything good in your life. So you definitely do have to, I mean, nowadays, you have to think about all that things. I think for me more, uh, as a new as a new parent, that's the, that's the one thing you're waking up this day, today and just saying, you know, how do you, like, is there any way that you can even like, keep your kids safe in this world? That's the hard part is that you teach them well, you be part of the solution, which is teach them to respect everybody and teach them that, hey, if you do face struggles, that there are avenues to get help, that there are situations that are going to be tough and that you got to face them. And that hopefully where it starts is I think that you and your wife are going to be part of the solution is just be good parents. Make sure you raise your son to respect people, to not judge people, to make sure that they have the theory in life that they got to work hard for everything, not take advantage of people, not cheat their way to get ahead. And by doing that, I think you're part of the small solution in that if you raise your kid good, that all you can do is hope that they turn out to be a positive individual. But this life is tough and uh, we got to teach our kids that it's a tough life and sometimes they're going to have to face adversity, but it's not really how many times they get knocked down or how many times they hear negative news, but how do they respond when those situations happen? And that's what I really tell my clients is life is really only 1% what happens to you, and 99% how you deal with it. How do you handle when things go astray? And uh, it's a tough time, but luckily you and I, we have sports as an avenue, as an escape. That's one of my escapes in terms of dealing with a tough job that I have is that I got sports as an outlet when you get to enjoy a Sunday with the family in the morning time, and then 1 o'clock rolls around, you get your snacks in order, and you watch Lions football, baby. And so far... The Lions have given us a lot of great news, and uh, to come away with a victory, it was amazing. It was nice to see them play a divisional foe tough, and we expected it. But for me, you know, because I am one of the people that's not watching as many football games, to watch a game like that was a little bit of a grind because of the fact that the offense, you know, on both sides of the football wasn't exactly there. So for the one game I watched this week, it was the Lions game. Whew! What a defensive battle, huh? Did you appreciate it? You know, it was it was a game that I was I was waiting for something to break, and that was it was going to break one way or the other. It seemed like uh, the Lions were had a couple injuries uh, during the game, and it, it seemed like that was going to start to kind of just kind of mount too much for them, and and then really it it affected the the Vikings. I think if Dalvin Cook would have stayed healthy the entire game. I think the Lions wouldn't have had really any shot to really win this game. But cuz he the dude was he's out there and he'd get at least 5 to 10 yards a, a carry it seemed like and the Lions defense was 
was definitely holding, but they weren't getting those consistent consistent stops. And you know, I don't like to make light of a guy going down and getting hurt, but the dude's knee went kablooey. Yeah. And as soon as that happened, I'm like, oh man, it's it's done for the Vikings. And at that point, it really was. It's back and forth, and it was going to be who whoever could get like the to 14 points, and that's uh, that's essentially how it played out. In the midst of the contest, were you saying to yourself, wow, the Lions could have had Dalvin Cook? He looked pretty good. He looked explosive. He looked like he was a little bit better than Amir Abdullah. Amir did a good job, and we have to give him credit for the hard running that he was able to do. I mean, earning 94 yards against the Vikings seemed you know, a lot more significant than the stat sheet might indicate, but a lot of people were looking at Dalvin Cook and the way that he ran and said, wow, this guy could be something in the future. It is unfortunate that he went down like that, a non-contact injury. But, hell, the Lions, Amir Abdullah, I think that you, you got to be at least hopeful that he's still, you know, still healthy, and Dalvin Cook is facing a long rehab. I do feel a certain way about Dalvin Cook, and I'm actually going to say that I don't mind that the Lions don't have Dalvin Cook at this point. That was a guy who a lot of people wanted the Lions to take Dalvin Cook in the first round. And that would have been ridiculous because he wasn't the player that we needed. And I see Dalvin Cook, he is a lot like Amir Abdullah. And I'm pretty sure I've said that. He's Amir Abdullah 2.0. I think he does have fumbling issues, even though they made they made him up to be like the second coming of like Jesus Christ on the broadcast. I'm not sure if, if you got that feeling. Is all the post game, all the all the info, infographics that they showed was sort of like Oh, Delvin Cook, through three games, he broke Adrian Peterson's three-game record when he was a rookie, and he has the most yards through three games. And all I keep seeing was three games. You're anointing this guy after three games. And you know, I'm fine with Jared Davis in the first round, and I, I get the tease Tabor. He was just activated. He, I, I didn't really see him on the field at all yesterday. But I do understand that cornerbacks take a little bit longer to, to develop, and the the guy that they always compare Tease Tabor to is to, to Darius Slay. And if I I'd say if in in you know two to three years we have Darius Slay and then also a second Darius Slay in Tease Tabor on the opposite side, I think that's going to help us a lot more than what Dalvin Cook could really bring to this offense. The guy that I'm more upset the Lions didn't take was Kareem Hunt, and that's a whole nother conversation. So Dalvin Cook, not that worried that the that the Lions don't have him, especially now that his, uh, his knee is a bunch of raw meat. Does it give you any concern that the Lions offense, in similar years, has been a situation where they haven't come through and helped the defense out? So remember, we've seen a team that had the number two ranked defense in all of the NFL. And then when it came down to the postseason, you know, you had that epic game versus Dallas. But this go around in 2017, we kind of have to change our focus and look at, oh my goodness, this is a stout defensive team that wants to kind of control the ball on offense, utilize the run game to keep control and to keep everything in control. Are you okay with that? Because how I look at it, I say, man, it makes for tough viewing because you're going to see a lot of running plays that are going to be two yards, four yards, possible negative two yards, but they are hell-bent. The Lions are hell-bent on controlling the game through the run. And if Amir Abdullah stays healthy, we might have to accept the fact that he might be in that 80-yard to 100-yard window in order to keep the ball, in order to keep the defense off of the field, and this defense is going to be stout and forcing a lot of turnovers and getting a lot of pressure. That defensive line is turning a lot of heads, making a lot of people go, whoa, whoa, did we underestimate what this defensive line could really do? So are you okay with potentially viewing the Lions as a major defensive force while we wait for this offense to pick it up? If that's what we're going to be, if it's going to get us wins, I am completely fine with that. And I, I did have a feeling going into this game that the the Minnesota Vikings, they do have a very good defense. I watched a little bit of one of their previous games, and their front four really were able to get after quarterbacks. And that was the that was I knew that that was going to be an issue for the Lions. And it was it was nice to see that they actually knew that was going to happen and they game plan for that. They made sure that, or at least for the most part, they tried to get put Stafford in situations where he can get the ball off quick. So he isn't, uh, so he isn't touched up too much. Didn't really work out too well since he, I think he was sacked like six times 
And I, but some of that might be on Stafford himself because he's holding on to the ball. But they they knew that Golden Tate was probably going to be locked down. They knew Marvin Jones was going to be locked down. So they they worked with what they had. They Amir Abdullah was able to power himself to nearly five yards of carry. He he almost they made so again uh, the broadcast they made so much of how the Lions they haven't had a hundred yard rushers in fifty five games. Just play the game. Come on, guys. And, and Abdullah almost got there, and I think the offense did exactly as much as they needed to. And I think if the defense, if it would have been a, a more lopsided battle where the Vikings were just able to just score on the defense, I think you would have seen the Lions open up that playbook. All we got to do is just look at the stats. Here are the numbers. Last year, the Lions only forced 14 turnovers in 16 games. The entire season, already through four games, they have 11 takeaways. They're plus nine in the NFL turnover differential, meaning they got nine more turnovers than they've given up. Those are astounding numbers. They're tied for the league lead in terms of the number of forced turnovers. That gives you extra possessions. That allows your defense to kind of do some things. And it just shows you that, hey, just look at the final drive. I mean, Minnesota has the football. They potentially could do some things to, to come back and tie the game. And boom, what happens? You know, Case Keenum throws the football and Thielen, you know, makes a move, an athletic move, and Quinn just, bam, right to the football. And I, it, I think it, teams are underestimating our defense, that they they don't see this defense as a team that's going to be able to, that either one, they're going to shoot themselves in the foot with getting off sides. You know, there was the time that they, they were at fourth and one, and they they went out there, but all they did was they waited and couldn't draw them off sides, and then they ended up wasting a timeout. And Jason, here's the scary part, too. This is without Jared Davis and without Kenny Galladay really contributing much so far in the early parts of the season. Imagine if this team can continue to get better. Maybe, just maybe, we can sit here and start to say, you know, in early October that this is a playoff team and this is a team that we can expect to win a postseason game. Again, I ask you and I implore you to kind of look at that offense. Do you think it's enough to kind of be this conservative offense that may, maybe is only getting one or two touchdowns a game? This is an offensive league. When you go forward and you got to play the likes of Green Bay, and that's how I always look at it, and I put a poll up, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds here, on our Twitter page, at Detroit Podcast, a lot of our fans, a lot of our supporters believe that the Lions are in contention to win the division, which would allow you potentially to have a home game. So a lot of good things can happen, but when you match up what the Lions are doing offensively versus the capabilities of Green Bay and Aaron Rodgers, still leaves a little bit to desire in that the run game has to get better. They have to be a little bit more willing to to throw the ball deeper and uh, utilize the tight ends and, and, and really kind of improve every aspect of the offense because I don't think 14 points is going to win you a lot of games in the NFL. One or two touchdowns, not in this league. I don't, I don't think so. It's not going to win you a lot of games, but when you have a defense who's holding a team to seven points, it's going to at least keep you into some games. And I, I, I honestly believe this offense – it it can it'll play to what it needs to do. When when we're down, they're gonna open up the offense. They're gonna let Matt Stafford run more of a, a no huddle to keep teams off balance. And we have the players, Golden Tate, Marvin Jones can even do a little bit. And you saw that they they started incorporating some of the other tight ends outside of Eric Ebron. Darren Fell seemed to catch every single ball that was coming his way on Sunday. Uh, so you, I, the one thing that did surprise me about the offense, if anything, is that you didn't see a lot of theoretic yesterday. I would have said, I would have thought, I, I know they were running the ball a lot with Amir Abdullah, but you didn't see Riddick out there on third downs when, when you're looking to get some yards. And that theoretic is the guy that they've been going to for the past two seasons. Now I know some of that probably is they put Zenner in there as a scheme to help with pass blocking, but it's it's just like last season. You saw when no when we didn't have Theo Riddick in the offense, the we just kind of slowed down. So I think he still needs to be a key part of this offense going forward. But do you think though the control of the clock kind of offense being a little bit conservative, a lot of checkdowns, utilizing the tight end for some certain plays? Do you think that offense, if it evolves, is going to get any better, or do you feel like you know what they may just be relying heavily on the defense? and wanting only to score between 17 and 21 points, if they get to that number, they'll be satisfied. You think they're okay with this? They're running the football. I mean, they still have yet. They have a <laughs> they have a lot of games. It's been documented. 
significantly, they have not had an individual rusher have 100 yards since 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016. Jason, we're in 2017. They don't have a rusher that can get 100 yards. And I feel like when you parlay that to talking about the playoffs, what if you got a 21-17 lead late in the game and you want to pound the rock and you can't? I'm more in favor of improving the offense and a little bit, you know, maybe going away from the run as much as possible and maybe utilizing the screen game and theoretic, like you said, because you're playing with fire if that defense doesn't get all those turnovers. And you, let's say you have a ball game where Amir Abdullah is getting a lot of three and outs. You're trying to run the football. It's going to put a lot of pressure on the lines to be in close games late. And when you play with fire, Sometimes you get burned, and well, I hope you, we don't get burned in the postseason. Aren't you playing with fire either way? If you you're playing with fire, if you don't pass the ball and you're, you're relying on your defense, you're playing with fire if you open up the offense and you let Matt Stafford pass the ball down the field a number of times. If you are going up against uh, a defense, not this season, but the, take the Seattle Seahawks when they have their when their when their defense is is rolling and they have the secondary that's just able to shut down everybody. You're you're playing with fire there. There's no one answer for this Lions team. They're going to go and game plan every single day or every single game, and they're just going to try. They're going to put out the best performance that they can, and you, and that's truly what I what I saw against the Vikings is that they game planned for what they knew was going to come, and they they were able to execute. So now I assume you've watched Green Bay. You've seen what they were able to do versus the Bears. Now, you can't give them a lot of credit. I mean, the Bears are in flux. They now have announced, finally, that Trubisky is going to be the starter. But Green Bay can score the football. They have the ability now to do some things offensively. And they have ability, again, they're the reigning NFC North champions. And it seems like the Lions have had a really a tough time you know, getting over the hump. Based on what you've watched with Green Bay, do you feel like the Lions are ever so close to being right there with them, to be contenders, to win the division? I, I think they are. I think it's it's really going to be a battle, the two games that we do play them this year. Just looking at, at who they've played so far Go this Lions! year. Go Lions! Yeah! Whatever. They they played a, a battered Seahawks team at home. They lost to the Falcons, who we lost to the Falcons too, and they needed overtime to beat the Bengals, and then they manhandled the Bears. Uh, so I think we are just as capable as the Packers to win the NFC North this year. Their defense, I think, is suspect, where I think our defense, I think you can you can measure the two. I think our defense is a little bit better, where their defense kind of blows. I think their offense might be a little bit more uh, suited for the NFL, where the Lions still need to pick it up a little bit more. So it's, it's truly going gonna, gonna to be a battle, and it's going to come down to Week seventeen, because that's that's what it is. It's Lions and Packers. I already said it. I called it when we when we, when we did it out. It's going to be a flex game. It's going to be the last game of the season, and it's going to determine the NFC North. Jason, great test for the defense coming up this Sunday. Guess who rolls into town off of a fabulous performance versus the New England Patriots? Superman Cam, who doesn't want to talk to the media. Superman Cam is coming to town. I mean, the New England defense is it's atrocious, one of the worst in the league so far, but Cam Newton can do some things with his legs. I feel like he's a much better quarterback than Case Keenum. So you got to look at it, too, in that the Lions have been pretty lucky in terms of the competition they faced. Case Keenum, you've had the Giants who who aren't really that good. You, you lost the contest to Matt Ryan, but you, you, you held your own in that game. So I'm looking forward to seeing what the Lions are capable of doing Versus a solid football team coming in off of a great victory. So this Sunday, again, each and every week, the competition gets better and they got to keep proving it. But I feel like if the Lions can continue this style of play, keep the games close, hey, with the quarterback that they have, I'm starting to buy a little bit more and more into what Caldwell's trying to do. It's a little bit more, you know, of a situation where everyone's going to be a little bit more nervous as each game goes on because... The Lions obviously aren't going to try and blow teams out, and they might not even be able to. So it's going to be a lot of close contests, controlling the football, playing solid defense, pinning your ears back, and hoping you can destroy Cam Newton. But uh, he might have himself, you know, if the Lions can do some things, he might have himself a terrible game. And it's nice to see, at the same time, you know, before our commercial, I want to talk to you about this. It was nice to hear Rodney Harrison, because one of the activities I like to do around 7 o'clock is kind of just sit back and watch some of the highlights on Channel 4 before the Sunday night game. Rodney Harrison comes out and he says, look, Glover Quinn is probably the best safety in the entire National Football League. And a lot of people were taken aback going, whoa, 
you know, the Lions are getting some national attention outside of Peter Schrager. He loves the Detroit Lions. But outside of that, people in the nation are taking notice of what the Lions are doing. If you can do some damage versus Cam Newton, if Glover Quinn can continue to be that steadying force in the secondary, my goodness, we might have some... uh, we might have some. We might have to raise our expectations with these lines. We maybe, maybe we could even talk about you know the Super Bowl or, or or things like that. Because hey, what does it take to win championships? A solid defense, and it's nice to see, right? Yeah, this Lions defense is it's really quietly been built up. You know, you have you start with Ziggy Anza and Haloti Nada uh, on the line, and then you know Darius Slay has been here a little while. Glover Quinn really uh, people are taking notice now, but he's. He's really been probably the best person in the Lions defense for the last couple of years. He's the guy when he's healthy. He's he's Mister Do Everything. He does it. He's all over the field. Is he the best he's, in the league? I think he is. I okay. think uh, he he's right up there. You put him in the in the conversation with guys like Earl Thomas and and Eric Berry. And outside of I don't know too many more safeties who I, who are being talked about as the best safeties in the NFL. So I think Glover Quinn, and he's definitely stepped it up this year, at least through the first four games of the season. Uh, he really has separated himself from from a lot of the NFL. But just it, it it's 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 nice to see that we finally the defense isn't the the butt of the jokes all the time. We aren't you know thirtieth in in the NFL and just not able to stop anybody when we need to. The the defense is finally actually they're winning games for us. Unbelievable, Jason. We're sitting here three and one. Carolina's coming to town. It's going to be a situation where we get to be excited. Maybe going four and one. I think that it's going to be important this year. Get that home game in the postseason. Continue to evolve because for both Jim Caldwell and Matthew Stafford, it's about time now to get some results, get some numbers in the positive column when it comes to the postseason. I think that the Lions are doing some things and playing to their strengths. And hey, despite the injuries, there's others stepping up. We haven't seen that. In a long period of time, you got Anthony Zettel coming in, doing some things. You got other guys that are stepping up and contributing. And hey, they've they've been able to kind of handle to hear Whitehead going down for a couple plays. You've handled other situations, and it starts to indicate what Adam and I have been screaming about for years. Hey, you got a system where you can plug and play other pieces, and it's a little bit more about the system going forward than it is about the individual talent. And when you can do that, you know what that means, Jason long-term success like the Patriots and really exciting to kind of see and talk about. It's a lot better. It is, it's just better to talk about the Lions than it is to kind of talk about, you know, getting screwed or, or other type situations. It's, it's, it's a nice spot to be in. Definitely. And so going into Sunday, Lions, Panthers, I know I had them as a, when we did our whole predictions, I had them as a loss. You had them as a win. You know, both of us had them at two and two after the first four games of the season. And, They've exceeded our expectations. So me with the loss going for for Carolina, you with a win, are you changing that at all with how you see the Panthers? I know for me, I'm going to lean more towards Lions getting, getting a victory this week because I, I truly believe with what, the, what they can do on defense and the possibilities that they can have on offense, the this team, can they're going to be in it with anybody. Jason, I wrote down a victory, so I'm going to stick with it. I think that the Lions at home are a formidable force. They got to run the football. They got to, you know, they got to execute the plan in place. And with Matthew Stafford, I think that if it's it is a shootout, then it'll be a situation where hopefully Matthew Stafford and that offense is up to the task. Maybe with the returning Jared Davis. Maybe, maybe with a Kenny Galladay who can extend some plays with his, you know, deep threat options. So I, I like what I'm seeing. And uh, hey. At this point in time, you're a quarter of the way into the season. I'll take the stand similar to Jim Caldwell. You're three and one. You could have been four and zero oh. onto the second quarter of the season. You want to kick it off well at home versus Carolina. Expect another close game. And uh, if the Lions have the ball late, look out. Well, we'll take a quick break when we come back. It, it's it seems like it's just overshadowed. The, everything it seems everything else in the sports world is overshadowed because. It doesn't really feel like it's Michigan Michigan State week, but it clearly is Michigan Michigan State Saturday. What seven thirty? Seven thirty, baby! Under the lights in Ann Arbor. We'll definitely talk about it right after this quick timeout. Jason, I want to tell you about our host site, Podomatic dot com. When Adam and I first started this project, we were looking for a host site to place all of our recorded audio. And as of this recording, we've recorded about six to seven hundred podcasts, and we put them all in one place, Podomatic. Dot com. Why, you ask? Very easy to use, 
a quality host site. When we're done recording this podcast, boom, quick post-production. Then we put up all of our audio, and it takes about five minutes to generate a quality link so that all of our supporters can find us. If you're looking to start a brand new project, a brand new podcast, and you want a quality host site, Doc and Jock, Jason, Jerry, Vito, all the hosts here on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network, we're going to recommend one host site, and that's Podomatic.com. I be on it all night, man. I be on it all day. Straight up, pimp. If you want me, you can find me in the air. I'm on it, 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 I'm on it. Time and time again, I got to turn that round and tell these hoes that I am the agent. Motor City Sports Rant, Detroit Sports Podcast, dot com. Is this some big boy, Jason? It is big boy. I like my new album. You listen to it? I listen to a couple of the tracks. It's not bad. It's not bad. He's good stuff. This is Big Boy featuring Killer Mike, Kryptonite, huh? Not too bad. Okay, not too shabby. You still get a chance to program the music, so good for you. Jason, I'm surprised at how you're feeling towards this contest. Right when the Michigan State game ended, I was tweeting right away. I'm like, boom, I like what Michigan State did versus Iowa. Played a much better brand of defense, a lot less mistakes. They learned from the disaster in that contest versus Notre Dame. Now Michigan State is rolling up to Ann Arbor, and it seems to me like there's a little bit more hope for the Spartan side because prior to John O'Korn's emergence, people were kind of thinking that, you know what, no matter what, Michigan State was going to get dominated. Now, when you kind of look at some of the finer points, there is a chance for Michigan State to compete, and I want to get your sense of this first. Were you more confident that Michigan State was going to compete when Wilton Spate was the quarterback? Because it's been announced. It's all set in stone. Wilton Spate's got an injury that's going to keep him out for a longer period of time than people had expected, and John O'Korn's the guy. When I hear that, I'm a little bit more excited because of the fact that, look, he has performed well. you got to give O'Korn credit for what he did versus Purdue, came in there and led that offense. But we have yet to see what it looks like for him against a team like Michigan State under the bright lights. And don't you think that potentially that there might be a couple mistakes that come in to Michigan State's favor having John O'Korn in this situation? I feel like, you know, I had more confidence with Wilton Spate when he was there. You know, I felt like Michigan State had a better chance. I feel like Michigan's offense is coming into its own. But I feel like there might be a couple opportunities for Michigan State to get some turnovers if John O'Korn's behind center. And really, I, what I would say is the only way... Sparty has a chance this week because they're going to have to get out to a lead. They're going to have to, in the first couple drives, they're going to have to take care of business. They're going to have to score touchdowns, and their defense is going to have to stand pat for a little while because I do I do think that there might be some growing pains for the Michigan offense. I think Harbaugh is going to have that team ready oh. real quick, though. If they aren't coming straight out of the gate and scoring touchdowns, by after the first quarter at least i think the michigan offense will be will be ready to go it's at that point it's going to be it's going to be a, a shootout between who's got the better offense who's got the better defense i i'm i am definitely concerned and i think another thing that o'corn has going for him he's not in unfriendly confines it would be one thing if they were in spartan stadium and we had a huge crowd and it was just berserk there he's going to be in michigan stadium he's going to be unless you know he has a bunch of turnovers and the crowd turns on him it's he's going to he's going to have some time to work out the kinks do you feel like the extra bye week for Michigan is going to help O'Corn in that offense. I feel like Michigan State might be a little bit more crisp going into that contest. I feel like if O'Corn had another game to play, I feel like that might have also helped him in this upcoming contest. But like you said, and most people are viewing it this way, I think it's going to be a close contest. The spread is ridiculous, 13 and a half points. I feel like oh, that opening line spread is ridiculous. And if you want to make some money, I don't see this game being uh, more than a 7 to 10 point contest. Lay your money heavily on Michigan State plus 13. I think you might win a, a boatload of money. Yeah, I would I would lean more towards that ladder that O'Corn would have been much better served if Michigan had another game for for them to play instead of having that bye week last week because now he's had he's going to have two entire weeks of of thinking about Michigan State and realizing that this is going to be the first game that he starts while it's not Ohio State I, everyone knows even though Sparty wants it to be true Sparty isn't the biggest game for for Michigan Ohio State is always the biggest game so it's not that but I'd say that this is probably the next biggest game on Michigan's schedule you know it would be one thing if they had been winning Big Ten uh, titles for the last couple of years. 
but they still haven't won anything. And Michigan State is a hump that they have to get over every single year. So going into a rivalry game, everyone always says it. Anything can happen. And you and I can say it openly and honestly. Michigan's defense is a top five defense in the entire country. So Michigan State cannot roll up there and try to run the football down Michigan's throat. It's going to be a situation where you have to open up Michigan's defense and figure out creatively how to get into that defense and try to figure things out. Because if Michigan State is conservative, if they perform similar to what the Lions are trying to do with that run game, you're going to have a problem because I can see Michigan's defense penetrating that offensive line quite a bit and getting into, you know, the, the, getting into the backfield quite a bit, forcing some issues with L.J. Scott. One thing that has to happen is, and like I said, you know, obviously Jason and I are Michigan State supporters, but we give all due respect to Michigan's defense. It's outstanding. And that's why we're saying that Michigan State has to find another running back outside of LJ Scott to do some things. Madre London has to do a lot better job. Holmes has to get more consistent touches and do some things. I don't feel like lining up playing smash mouth football against Michigan is going to produce a uh, a lot of success. So, and that might be the undoing of this of this Michigan State team. They might not be year. willing to, right? Is it seems like when they need to get creative, that they just stick to what they're doing, and whether it's the Antonio, whether it's the offensive coordinators, they don't really seem to have that capacity of opening up that playbook and really exploiting where they can exploit. Exactly. And so I think Lewerke might have to kind of do some things, might have to put this team on his shoulder. But, hey, I like the emergence of Felton Davis, huh? That was a nice performance versus Iowa. Nice stuff, huh? Yeah, it always seems that Michigan State has some random wide receiver who just breaks out. We, we, you know, Aaron Burbridge, the the Geem Shabazz, that always just come out of nowhere. Throw the ball deep, they, baby. Let's see what you got. They're all Big Ten. But, Throw uh, it to Felton. How many tweets am I going to be screaming on Saturday? Throw the ball to Felton. Listen, Jason, a conservative offense is not going to beat Michigan. Look, if they turn the ball over, if L.J. Scott you know, returns to the, the old guy that fumbles the football all the time, if you don't win the turnover battle, if you don't line up and do some things creatively and uh, maybe open up the playbook a little bit and throw some passes in that 7- to 15-yard window range and uh, use, utilize the tight ends and maybe a couple trick plays, I feel like straight up, if, if Michigan State goes with the approach that they've used versus Iowa and Notre Dame, they're going to get destroyed. So I'm hoping that in this kind of a contest, Michigan State lets it all hang out because it's going to be needed. But I want to bring up a point and one that many Michigan State supporters are looking to and kind of you know heavily relying on. Look at last year's team. Last year's team was a three-win team, right? Look at the contest that occurred Michigan versus Michigan State. It was basically outside of the you know that botched two-point conversion. It was a relatively decent and close contest, right? Don't you think Michigan State is a little bit better this go-round in 2017 with a better quarterback? They're playing a lot better, and their defense is a lot better doing some things as well. So I feel like this is going to be a tight contest, a very tight contest, and and whichever squad makes the biggest plays is going to come out victorious. And, you know, sitting here, I'm not so certain it might not be Michigan State this go-round. I'm hoping, but uh, I'm thinking, you know, that Michigan State, if they're willing to do some things, has an opportunity to compete with Michigan. That's all we can ask for, a quality contest rolling up there to Ann Arbor. And no doubt, I've, at the beginning of the season, I think a lot of people here and all the Michigan fans were definitely hoping that this team is going to be a, a national championship caliber team, but that's clearly not the case at this point. So what, is, what does Michigan bring to the table? What have you seen from them? Their defense. That's really the, that's the main thing. Their defense can keep them in the games. And they basically just they wear out teams. I haven't seen a complete domination from Michigan yet, and I I hope to God it isn't going to be against Michigan State because if they do come out and just absolutely you know house us, it's gonna it's not gonna it's not gonna sit well. And for another year of having to deal with Michigan fans gloating and holding it over Sparty fans, uh, but I I I still see it's going to be a close game. I would obviously take uh, Michigan State in the points right now but in the end I'm I'm still gonna say Michigan's gonna pull this one out because that just seems to be their MO this season is that they're they're able to hold teams for a while but there there'll be a breaking point at some point and I think Michigan State will Michigan will end up with the victory in the end in that fourth quarter who's gonna want it more because everybody going into it saying it's gonna be physical it's gonna be a dog fight it's gonna be wild there's gonna be back and forth momentum swings again who gets those turnovers? Which quarterback? You know, both both quarterbacks, Lewerke in his first go-around versus Michigan on the road. Jason, I think it's very fair what you said in that 
the slightest of edges goes to Michigan because because it's in Ann Arbor. I feel like if the game was in East Lansing, you'd give the edge to Michigan State, but I agree with you. Um, obviously, yes, I'm taking Michigan State and the points, but I'm looking at this as a very close contest, potentially in the neighborhood of Michigan 17, Michigan State 13. And I think that's what's going to be. Michigan State might have that potential to have the ball at the end of the game, and uh, they might just come up short because, hey, it's, 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 it's a big-time game. It's on the road. A lot of these players are young for Michigan State, and I do feel like they're going to walk away, not with a moral victory, but feeling like, look, we came away from this contest not getting blown out, but they're going to have a super tough time on the road. I think that if you pick Michigan State, you might be leaning toward being a little bit of a homer because Michigan has a quality defense, and they're going to be able to exploit some of the – I don't – because like what we said, we're hoping – Michigan State unloads on that offense. We hope that they do different things, but the, the you know we sit here, we watch Michigan State game in and game out. And what do we see? They run, the, they try to run the ball, they try to do smash mouth similar to the Lions, and sometimes their play calling in what we see. I mean, Jason, you've seen the landscape around college football. It's an offensive league. I mean, you got teams dropping forty and fifty points, and Michigan State is grinding it out, and they're, they're still a little bit old school. I can appreciate it. it's winning football. But when you enter into now 2017 on the road, you got to open it up. You got to throw the ball deep. You got to be able to get those defenders off of you because if Michigan lines up eight in the box, forget it. LJ Scott can't go anywhere. You're going to be looking at second and nine each and every possession. If that happens, forget it. 730. Oh, I can't wait to see what Michigan State tries to execute. But I think you and I are, you know, hoping that Michigan State can make it an entertaining contest because, whew. 17-13 17-13 doesn't seem like an exciting game at you this know, point in time. Is there a player on either team that you think will really be the the focal point and could be the the tipping point for, for either of their teams? I, I know I have a couple. for I, I have two specific players for each team, which for it's, it's going it's to go down to the running backs to me. Uh, for Michigan, it would be Ty Isaac. If he can really manhandle this Michigan State defense, uh, it's probably going to lean more towards Michigan. And conversely for Michigan State, you know, LJ Scott has, I mean, to me, and I, I, I don't know if you agree, but he's he's disappointed this year. And he was a guy you, Michigan State has had really good running backs in, in the past couple of years, you know, going back to, to Le'Veon Bell and Javon Ringer. They've, they've just been able to get better each year. And I haven't seen... LJ Scott take that next step this year. So if he somehow had a fire lit under him and he can really take this game and run with it, uh, no pun intended, but he could be the difference in that game. You know, he was the reason that they, they won the big 10 championship over Iowa to send him to the, the college football playoff. And it would, it's going to take an effort from him to really muscle this team to a victory. For me, I'm not even going to say a player. I'm going to really be looking for what Don Brown's philosophy is going to be. Is he going to blitz a lot? Is he going to put a lot of men in the box? Is he going to do some secret zone reads or things like that, zone blitz packages? Because, Jason, at this point in time, Michigan's defense can can score points. If Michigan State turns it over and if they can confuse Lewerke a little bit on that Michigan side of the defense, I think Don Brown's underrated. A lot of people are talking like, look, this guy potentially could be a guy that could be a head coach. I'm thinking that Don Brown is going to bring up some things that maybe even Michigan State has not seen before in terms of looks, in terms of giving things, uh, in terms of masking what they want to do. So for me, I'm thinking that Don Brown could come away from this game as being the superstar, the guy that shines. Now on the other side of the ball, I think that John O'Corn has to stand up to that pressure. He has to make the quick throws. He has to be able to extend drives like he's been doing. In the end, though, Jason, a point that maybe we haven't talked about yet is that whoever scores the touchdowns is going to be ahead of the curve here because, you know, when you get into the red zone, it's going to be imperative to score seven points because if you always settle for three, I think the team that probably scores the the second touchdown first is probably going to win the contest. The first team to get their second touchdown is probably going to have an 85% chance or more of winning that game because it's going to be so close. And, you know, John O'Corn, Don Brown, those are my two guys. And on the Michigan State side of things, Lewerke and Mark D'Antonio in that offensive unit. I think that um, Mark D'Antonio in these kind of contests, you got to remember what we saw versus Notre Dame. It didn't look like Michigan State came to play at all. It looked like they were overwhelmed by the situation. And it looked like, whoa, a lot of mistakes on that front. And then again, you saw conservative play calling. You didn't see them 
effectively do what they were trying to do. Lewerke is going to have to go out there and carry this team like Connor Cook was able to do on so many occasions. Ken, you know, you, you know how Michigan State does it. They got coordinators, you know, a couple coordinators at the offense, a couple coordinators on the defensive side. Can they put together an effective game plan that can be utilized on the road versus Michigan? That'll be key. But in the end, Mark D'Antonio has got to get this crew ready to go. If they're ready to go, 60 minutes, ball out, and they can do some things on offense, maybe confuse John O'Corn as well. We might be looking at a situation next week where we're celebrating ruining Michigan season. Well, Saturday, 7.30 p.m. Where are you watching it? I'll probably be watching it at home. Same here. I'm probably going to do some work, get out a little bit early. Um, I wish I could have been in Ann Arbor. Barstool's coming to do their tailgate. It seems like that thing's blown up. A lot of people have posted it on social media. A lot of fun tailgates. But in this go-around, you know, with what we talked about at the beginning of the show, with the sheer amount of alcohol that's going to be consumed that day, in and around Ann Arbor, I think it's safe for us, being two older gentlemen, to stay at home, watch the t- watch the game, scream our heads off, and have a good time. You can follow along on our Twitter page, at Detroit Podcast, for the entire contest, baby. Can't wait. Well, that'll do it for this episode of the Motor City Sports Rant. Uh, again, we want to send all prayers and thoughts to the victims and the, their families and anyone affected uh, in the, the shooting in, in Las Vegas. That's really, I mean, that's really all I can say, man. It's, it's, a, it's a horrible tragedy, and we have you in our prayers. See everybody next week. Thank you for your continued support of the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Okay, nice idiot. Uh, f- you. Bye bye. Good day, sir. I said good day. All right. Take care now. Bye bye then. Hey, you, sir. <laughs> <laughs>